Cornucopia Radio presents It was old Jim Withers that started it. He was sat on the entrance gate one damp, cold September night, all alone in his little hut, watching Wheel of Fortune on a tiny TV with washed out colours and cursing a thermos flask that refused to keep his tea warm past three o'clock. Perhaps that was the reason he never noticed that he'd signed the wrong column on the form, meaning that the truck that should have gone to the biohazard facility rolled out for the regular city dump instead. But just one mistake wasn't enough for our little tale, and like a perfectly choreographed ballet of misfortune, the truck driver got confused, and on his last stop on the way to the dump, accidentally left behind a mysterious dumpster cart from the local army base in an unremarkable abandoned alleyway. And so it sat there for a few days, quietly bubbling away to itself, an ominous faint green glow emanating out from under its lid, illuminating the dark autumnal night that surrounded it. But then on the third night, the silence was loudly broken as a car screeched into the alleyway and a tearful, angry young woman jumped out, slamming the door shut and forcefully opening the boot. Without even looking, she emptied its stacked paper contents straight into the dumpster. It splashed and fizzled within as it happily ate the meal it had been presented with. Not quite digesting the books, but instead mushing them up and making everything vibrate with a strange power and energy. The crying woman didn't notice though. She simply snarled into the sky. That'll show you, you arrogant cheater. Say goodbye to your comic collection, you worthless cretin before slamming the car door shut and driving away into the night. Neither understanding nor caring about what she had left behind. It was a week later when the trash got its next meal. Buddy Simons was about to get his lunch money taken again. He tried fighting back, but all he ever got was slapped about. It was always three on one, so this day he decided to run. He'd done fine for a while, but they just weren't giving up. Even with the rain and the approaching thunder, he still managed to run until his feet stung and his breath was sharp, like cold needles pressing into his chest. Soon he was all the way downtown and knew he was lost. He didn't recognize anywhere. The rain pounded down and the low, thick clouds coiled around themselves, starting to rumble like a thousand angry rhinos. He leant against the dumpster, the one that wasn't supposed to be there, and bent forward as he gulped in huge mouthfuls of air, trying not to drink in the rain. When it happened, it wasn't like the movies. They didn't say anything, didn't speak. They just grabbed him, banged his head against the dumpster, pulled his jeans off, opened the lid and tossed him in. When Buddy unexpectedly hit the glowing liquid inside, everything felt warm and tickled his bare legs. The comics within this unholy soup started sloshing around him, and before long they began to sting, and then, like clinging needy things, they slowly began to cover him, head to toe. He started to panic and struggled to peel them off, but the liquid was like warm soda and just as sticky. The comics had been marinating in it, and they continually attached to him in layers, gaudy four-color print leaves of heroic action totally enveloping him. The boys slammed the lid shut and were shouting, calling him names as they rocked the dumpster, helping spread the comics all over him. Buddy couldn't catch his breath. It seemed so hot in here. The comics covered his face again and again. He couldn't breathe. It was too hot. He tried to scream, but only swallowed more of the liquid instead. It painfully burnt his throat, and he would have spat blood if the comics weren't so heavy over his face. Instead, 
he inhaled and gulped and lost his breath. In that moment, he knew for sure he was going to die. And that was when the lightning bolt hit the dumpster. A local shopkeeper who didn't see Buddy go in, but had heard the boys shouting and saw them rocking the dumpster, called the police. Patrol car 47 was nearby, on the way back from a minor call. The car pulled up and Officer Hendricks got out. He was just in time to see the boys rocking the dumpster, shortly before a brilliant flash of bright blue light blinded him. And a wave of force rocked him, making him lift his arm above his head, threatening to knock him down. He steadied himself as his vision returned from black to blurry. At first he thought he must be imagining the scene. The three boys were sprawled out in the alley, all of them bent and twisted. All three of them with trainers that released gentle wisps of smoke from their souls. The smoke fighting to rise against the constant downpour of the rain. But that wasn't the weirdest thing. The weirdest thing was hovering above the dumpster. It glowed faintly green and rustled like dry leaves despite the rain. It was human shaped but small, about the size of a boy. But whatever it was, it looked like it was made of a kind of paper. It had stuck to a rough shape, an outline, but at the same time swirled and bobbed loosely, as if a stack of comics had the idea they could be a boy. The thing had two bright green eyes that burnt like flames trying to escape recessed sockets. And it had a mouth, open and mushy, glistening like fresh papier-mâché. It screamed once, sounding like a boy choking at the start, but ending like something totally inhuman. Then it extended its arms, and paper that was at once both dry and yet still moved like fluid shot out in streams, covering two of the boys' faces. Officer Hendricks imagined them trying to scream but unable to, and watched as they flailed and scraped their still-smoking trainers along the ground, frantically clawing hopelessly at the paper streams that plastered and stuck them to the wall before lifelessly ceasing movement altogether. <laughs> the third boy, the largest of them, was closest to Hendricks, and he was already unholstering his gun as the boy, sobbing and panicking, ran towards him. As he drew level, Hendricks tried to shout, Get behind me! But the rain drowned out all sound he tried to make. Besides, he only got as far as Gah! before the thing from the dumpster coated the running boy's head in a torrent of slick, flowing paper. Pages from comics of heroism and superheroes filled the air around them. Hendricks noticed almost absent-mindedly a single panel showing Batman gliding, silhouetted by the full moon. But soon that panel, that page, was gone, as a stream of paper unrelentingly poured onto that unfortunate running child. He had stopped running now, though, and had fallen to his knees, trying to peel the pages off that clung to his face, clearly weak and numb, his fingers struggling to work and his arms heavy and uncoordinated. Stop or I'll shoot, commanded Hendricks, aiming his pistol at the flying, swirling mass of boy-shaped comics. The teen next to him fell over silently and was still. The thing that used to be Buddy but now wasn't looked at the cop and laughed, flying off up into the storm above him. And that was the day that Comic Book Boy was born. You've been listening to The Origins of Comic Book Boy. It was performed by Ben Warren, written by Arkan Mint, and produced and edited by Peter Beeston. The soundtrack was licensed via gemendo.com and a full track listing can be found on our website. 
In case you didn't know, we are Cornucopia Radio, and we've been making amazing spoken word audio like this for almost 10 years. So to listen to some of our previous productions and subscribe to our podcast, visit us online at cornucopia-radio.co.uk. Thank you.